Hello everybody and welcome to the 6th episode of Leadership Talks. It is heartening to receive your motivating and encouraging comments about this talk series. I am Rupam Shah, your host for the show and today I have with me someone who is a knowledge doyan, an internationally renowned expert specializing in pedagogy and the use of technology tools to enhance it. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Professor M. M. Pant, who has been working non-stop for past 50 years towards advancement of education in India and abroad. But before we enter into a conversation with him, let's have a look at his professional journey. Professor M. M. Pant has served as a Pro Vice Chancellor IGNU. With a doctorate in physics and an LLB degree, he has served as a legal practitioner in Allahabad High Court. He was a faculty member at IIT Kanpur, MLNR Engineering College, and also a visiting faculty at the University of Western Ontario, Canada. He is a visiting scientist to major research centers in England, Germany, and Sweden. He is associated in advisory roles with various national bodies like NCTE, NCERT, NIOS, Center for Educational Communications, and is also the Chairman Board of Studies, All India Management Association. He pioneered the Virtual Campus Initiative of IGNU. He has around 100 research papers published. He scripted an educational film titled Atoms, produced by IIT Kanpur, which won the International Cup of Rome Award and later the National Award in the year 1974. He has delivered talks and seminars at a number of international conferences in around 20 different countries of the world. Professor Pant's current work and interest revolves around the development, delivery, and promotion of educational models, leveraging the current and emerging technologies to develop future ready lifelong learners. Welcome, sir, uh, to this talk series. And uh, it's an absolute honor uh, to be talking to you today. Um, and I hope that all our viewers are going to be taking back a lot of good points which they can take back to their own professional life and use it meaningfully. Um, so my first question to you is that uh, you've done your PhD in physics and then you did law. So, so what was that which inspired you to be doing law after uh, doing a PhD in physics? See, uh, I am a kind of a lifelong learner. I like to learn new things. I could not do medicine because there is no way I could have gone and become a doctor after doing this because you have to go through the entrance exam in five years, etc. Law was more flexible. But let's keep that apart. Uh, law was easy to do uh, because it was less restrictive. Medicine is much more difficult to do. You can't just go and sit in a medical college and start attending lectures and so on and so forth. Uh, but I will share with you the benefits of doing this and why this is important. Uh, the practical part you can forget, but the important part which most people miss, and I think you will appreciate, we are moving towards an information society. So whether I talk physics or chemistry or biology or law, we are talking about information processing. Mm. All these are what Peter Drucker would have called knowledge workers. Mm. And therefore, when you are doing different kinds of information processing, you learn different ways of higher cognitive activities. Okay. And people who don't do that miss one part of it. Mm. And I will share with you concrete stories. So I was a member of the board of management of IIT Delhi for six years. Twice during those board meetings, I pointed out the problem in the decision which had already been approved and filed by the chairman board of governors, who was no less than Professor M. G. K. Menon. But he was gracious enough that when this was pointed out, he rolled back his decision and did another thing. So the problem is that a lot of people in administration are not aware of the legal aspects of things and therefore they take things for which then people have to go to court every other day. And the courts are burdened with a lot of litigation. Mm -hmm. It would not happen if people were more aware. Right. I can help, they say, prevention is better than cure. 
Right. And this is what we are trying to do for the coronavirus. We say we don't know the mm -hmm. coronavirus. Yes. Similarly, legal awareness among large number of people is better than litigation and yes. huge amount of piling up. Correct. This is a very important. But I take it to a bigger philosophical level. Mm -hmm. Just like when we speak in Hindi, occasional putting of Sanskrit is important. So when you talk of law, a lot of Latin phrases are put in. Ubijus, mm -hmm. remedium. Uh, Recepts are located, all kinds of things. One of the very famous maxims in law is ignorantia juris, non excusa. Now, you have heard of this in simple English saying ignorance of the law is no excuse. Yeah. And you can see this today also that if you don't know that there is a lockout, etc., you can't say I didn't know. Right. Now, look at the implication. When you are saying ignorance of the law is no excuse, it is your responsibility to find out the latest. Correct. And this is where my thing about learning comes up. Okay. I say ignorance itself is no excuse. Yes. And therefore, you have to constantly learn, unlearn, and relearn. So today, there is no point in your saying constitutional amendment gave me right to education. If I'm between six to fourteen, I must be in school. That is what that 2008 Act says. Hmm. But you have to unlearn and relearn that today schools are closed because of the other act of epidemic, etc. Et hmm. This is true of life. Absolutely. When we talked of this Latin phrase, that was man made laws. Yes. But natural laws are equally true. Yes. So if you say, I do not follow the law of coronavirus uh, infection or uh, contagiousness, it doesn't help because nature will do its own thing. Absolutely. So it is even more important than man-made laws to understand nature's law and to abide by nature's law. Absolutely. Which so is where great connection. biology come in. Lovely. Uh, yeah. Don't think, no, this is actually, in fact, if you, if you, you were interested in spirituality and so on, if you look at Buddhism, what did Lord Buddha say? Lord Buddha said, all our pain is because of ignorance. Yeah. I jokingly used to say, because you don't know Pythagoras theorem, therefore you are in pain. <laughs> but, <Yeah. laughs> but this is the fact. So I think one of the very important things to understand about education mm -hmm. is it is retrieving you from ignorance. Yeah. And we think of it as something which we are doing as a favor. I'm agreeing to study, I'm doing the homework. No. You are being salvaged from the ill consequences of ignorance. Right. And therefore, the more you are aware of, you cannot say, I know all the laws of physics, but I don't know the laws of chemistry and I will eat some poison and then have that effect. Or I don't know the laws of biology and I will be infected by a virus or whatever. Hmm. So the whole point is that education is about removal of ignorance. Right. Whether you take it as a religious format, as part of Buddhism, or hmm. you take it as a philosophical thing, or you take it as a practical thing. Absolutely. You violate the laws of nature, and if you take potassium cyanide, the mm -hmm. consequence will happen. Yes. It doesn't matter how in good faith you did it or in Lord's name you did it. Yes. This is not. See, yes. all this thing about religious place is over because the law of biology is working stronger yes. than the religious belief. Yes, sir. This is what my starting point is and this is why hmm. uh, law is very interesting because law has a principle of adversity. In fact, it's a very important thing. One of the first principles of natural justice is hear the other side. Hmm. So if all of the laws, it's called Audi Alter Important. Now the point here is that very often we take one view and we don't even look at the other view. Yeah. Even in science, we have a hypothesis and we verify this. Hmm. Right? But law is the one where you say no. I want somebody to represent the other side. Even if a client cannot afford a lawyer. And it is called informa pauperis. The court appoints a lawyer for that because they said without knowing or hearing both sides of a story, we cannot conclude. So to me, both are methods of getting at the truth. One is a scientific method, okay. one is the adversarial method, and one is maybe the spiritual method where you directly get to know from God what the method is. And right. Yeah. So it's such a beautiful connection that you made and uh, and it's so important that we should be knowing law and you said that ignorance is something which is not an excuse and you cannot uh, go ahead and say I did not know that it's actually the film should be knowing it and that's why in fact as you said that when you related it to spirituality saying that 
we are in pain or we are in sorrow because we do not know our true self our actual knowledge is hidden it is veiled with ignorance and so therefore uh, there, there is uh, sorrow or there is pain uh, so uh, su such a lovely connection uh, with ignorance law and the uh, the, the phenomena of uh, uh, science um so you've been always highlighting uh, that uh, the most important skill in the fourth industrial age is the skill of learning and uh, children to become self directed lifelong learners so sir uh, what should the educationists be doing so that they can enhance this skill in the students yeah so actually uh, it is very interesting all children are learners mm -hmm. If you look at small children, in fact, I will share with you a story. So once upon a time, when I was in my fifties, I was with a bunch of medical doctors from AIMS and some committee, etc. And conversation tended tended towards this question that why is it that as we grow older, our ability to learn something new becomes less? I was assuming it to be axiomatic, and I said children can learn so much in such a short time, and we yeah. take so much longer. Okay. Uh, What is the reason? And I was hoping that the doctor will give me a medical reason that mm -hmm. your nervous system has this, or your nerves can't do this, etc. Like they say, with age, you have diabetes because your insulin mechanism reduces, etc. But they said no, nothing of the sort. At any age, you are perfectly capable of learning. There's a thing called neuroplasticity. There's nothing with the. It is our habits. Yeah. He said, "Have you observed a small child? A small child is spending all the waking hours learning." Mm hmm. Right, and young mothers have a problem trying to put them to sleep or etc. etc. Because until he's physically exhausted, he won't sleep just because it is time. And the moment he wakes up, and he or she wakes up in the morning, is asking questions right. or mimicking things or trying something. Hmm. Right, all the methods, the cognitive, affective, psychomotor, everything is doing. Yeah. Right. What happens is, as we grow up, we start working. I mean, studying from. Let's say morning breakfast to lunch. In lunch, we look for tea break. In tea break, we look for another tea break. No child looks for a break in between this process of learning. Mm -hmm. And this is the main difference. And all that we have to do is to allow that to continue. We should allow a child to be curious. Allow the child to ask as many questions, raise as many questions, challenge things. Uh, the problem is that we don't want to do that. The second thing is most children. So we try to figure out answers themselves. In fact, there's a very nice video by Alison Gopnik, which mm. talks about how babies learn, mm. and she says that it clearly shows that babies are like research people. They have a hypothesis, they do something, then they find the hypothesis doesn't work, they change their hypothesis, do something else, and so on till their hypothesis and observation match. Mm. This is babies are the R and D of humanity. Grown-ups are the marketing and sales. <laughs> <laughs> So, so the point is, all we have to do is to allow that and encourage that. The problem is that to establish our authority, we say we will tell you what you should. Yeah. Instead of saying we will help you know what you want to know, mm. which may sometimes be difficult and mm. challenging, and yeah. therefore that is. So education was about establishing authority. Even today. It is about establishing authority. When you get your degree, what does the convocation say? By virtue of the authority vested in me as vice chancellor of the university, I grant you this. This. It doesn't say you and I have worked together. We argued, we debated. Now you are worthy of standing on your own. We say authority of vice chancellor, and one letter from UGC removes the authority of the vice chancellor. So the whole point is from authority. We should go to just rekindling. Just let. Childhood prevail. In fact, there is a very interesting project at MIT. It is called Forever Kindergarten. So, okay. if you behave like a child mm -hmm. uh, in terms of childlike simplicity and curiosity, that is what it uh, needs. Correct. Correct. In fact, I can uh, share with you a very interesting quotation from Isaac Newton. Mm -hmm. So, Newton, as you know, was accomplished. He did so much things wonderful. In fact, people, in fact, wrote poems that nature is a nature's law. They hid in night. God said that you can be, and I was like. But when Newton was asked, "What do you think of your life?" Mm. He says, "I do not know what I may appear to the world. But to myself, I am like a child on the seashore, looking mm. now for a smoother pebble or a prettier shell, while the whole ocean of truth lay undiscovered." Yeah. So learning is about discovering truth. 
Correct. And truth is so vast that it doesn't get done by one person or one lifetime or a few people. And that is the pursuit of being human. The okay. pursuit of being human is try to understand how things happen, why things happen, what are the universal laws. Okay. See, these laws, IPC, CRPC, etc., are created by humans. They are binding to a territorial jurisdiction. Right. But nature's law are not binding to a territorial jurisdiction. Now with coronavirus, everybody knows that. <laughs> you cannot say, no, no, you will not come beyond this border. You can right. prevent the people not going across border. Right. But you cannot prevent the nature's law from not happening. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so, uh, so what you said is that basically inside our uh, classrooms in the school, we should be letting curiosity uh, uh, be there in the students. They should be asking oh, you questions. See, the problem is that it's there who, already. Who controls the classroom? Yes. See, what I'm saying is it is the authority. Hmm. See, the authority wants you to almost be indoctrinated in what their values are. Yeah. There's a very interesting example of this. I don't know, you were of course very young, but when we were uh, at school level, the atlas would always show Egypt, etc. as Middle East. Hmm. We, as grown up also, we call them Middle East. And then only recently when we started applying our minds, we said it is not Middle East for us, it is West Asia for us. It was Middle East for the British. Hmm. But even if you ask me today, I will call it Middle East because that's how I was grown. So the education is to put in the authority. See, hmm. for us, it is West Asia. Yeah. It's no longer Middle East. Yeah. But you talk to anybody hmm. who's had part of his education earlier, he will say Middle East, Middle East, Middle East. It's not Middle East, it's Middle East yeah. from their perspective. Correct, correct. The so rulers. So education, yeah. hmm. if it is allowed to, see, this is a big debate. And in fact, I'm very uh, serious about it. Who controls education? Hmm. It is the rulers who control education, whereas it should be the educators who should control education. Correct, correct. Yes, sir. Unfortunately, the educators have succumbed to the rulers. Right. To allow that. Yeah. yeah anyway, continue. So, uh, yes, sir. Actually, this is what some, uh, everybody else has also pointed out. I mean, I've had educationists here, and they have also said that there should be a large amount of autonomy which needs to be given to the school so that they are able to decide. But how will the ruling give them? autonomy? See, the point is that the, is the ruler driven. You know, he who pays the piper calls the tune. So the point is, uh, you know, right from, uh, in fact, if you know history, uh, the original idea was the divine right of kings. And the king can do no wrong. Hmm. So king decide the law, king decide the thing, king can do no wrong. It was only about 800 years ago that in England, the Magna Carta came where they said even the king is limited in what he can do. Mm. Now we have come to constitutional law where we say it's the constitution which binds us. But who writes the constitution? The people in power, the people yeah. in the constitution. So the, uh, the problem has been that somehow we have gone into the idea that education is a responsibility of the state. Hmm. And therefore, it will be colored by what the state thinks. Right. Whereas if education were not a state thing, hmm. then it would be very different. In fact, uh, so, so that is the point. So there is no point in people saying we want autonomy. Hmm. Because you cannot have autonomy unless you are autonomous. Hmm. Which means you should be free. Right. And uh, the answer to that is, and I have been saying this, that people should become independent educators. Hmm. So unless you are independent, see, look at the Indian freedom movement. Mm. Why was it led by lawyers? Because government employees couldn't have revolted against the government. Okay. Other employees could not have revolted against the zamindars. Mm. It was only lawyers who were not government employees mm. who understood the law. And some of them were educated in England to understand what freedom means. Yeah. And therefore, they could think of a new order. Correct. Correct. So the problem is that as long as your employees governed by the FR and SR etc. of the state, hmm. it will be very difficult for you to want autonomy and to anybody to give because I mean, if you are paying, hmm. then you want your wish to be implemented. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, continue. <laughs> 
<laughs> right, sir. Um, sir, because we are talking about curriculum, uh, uh, you've often quoted Professor uh, CNR Rao uh, saying that 90% uh, of our uh, uh, you know, universities and higher education institutions, they have got an outdated curriculum. And you've also said that by 2035, uh, these schools and the colleges and the universities will not look like what they look like now. They will become rather redundant. So I just want to ask you that what do you think uh, the universities are going to look like 10 years from now or any education institution would look like? So uh, see, firstly, uh, the both the quotation that I do is not my opinion. I am quoting important people. Mm -hmm. Professor Siena Rao was my senior colleague when I used to teach in IIT Kanpur. Mm -hmm. Then he got the Bharat Ratna, he's the only scientist with yes. the Bharat Ratna and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I quote him to say that he said this not in informal coffee mm -hmm. or in an interview with Rupam Sa, he mm -hmm. said this in the president sir. Huh, yes. And president is the visitor of all central universities. Mm -hmm. And he said this almost 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Nobody has reacted to it. Nobody said not 90%, it is only 80%. Because probably it is 99%. Hmm. <laughs> Nobody has said we should take our Bharat Ratna away from CNR Rao because he is doing, yeah. he is making a bad name for our universities. No, because they agree that this is right. Hmm. You see, it still agrees that most of his universities are no good. Hmm. The other thing that I have said is actually a report from the uh, Department of Science and Technology. It was published in 2014, India 2025, and has the signature of Narendra Modi in its foreword. Okay. And I tell this to education is you have no idea he has already said by 2035 you are not required. <laughs> he has signed it in that paper. So <laughs> one night he will tell you that this is all over. So anyway, on a more pragmatic note, <laughs> we have already seen because of this, this uh, corona thing <laughs> that everything that institutions stood for is already gone for a toss. Compulsory <laughs> attendance gone for a toss. <laughs> and chemical examination gone for a toss. Lectures <laughs> gone for a toss. Yeah. And the thing they criticize, distance learning, e-learning is coming up center stage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what we expect, and I think this is the way I now expect, I'm giving my opinion. Mm -hmm. The first thing that we see, and you would have already experienced this during the last month or so, mm -hmm. that actually we are talking teaching. Yeah. Whether it is at primary stage, middle stage, secondary stage, senior secondary stage, higher education, like some learning, it's like a doctor is a doctor, whether he's a pediatrician or a geriatrician or a diabetic specialist or anthropologist, he's first a doctor. Hmm. And therefore, distinguishing between primary, secondary, etc. is meaningless. We're talking education throughout. So we're talking about continuum of learning. Okay. Not by date of birth, age on certain set of birth, date for taking compartment, that is the open question. Hmm. The second thing is, therefore, these institutions need not be separate structures. So, like the uh, hospital, which is for healthcare, we're talking of cognitive development program of the nation with people at different stages and different needs for cognitive development. Mm. And there is no point in grouping them in 40 or 20 or 100 because today you are saying even 40 won't work, they should be only 10 in a class or 15 in a class. Mm. So, what we are saying is with establishment of IT communication and especially with artificial intelligence leading to personalization, you will have a continuum of education. Now for people to meet, you can have core learning spaces. So just like we have seen the emergence of core working space, mm -hmm. where there can be a one person company, a bigger company, whatever, instead of segregation of school, college and university, you will have neighborhood core learning spaces. So okay. everybody who is interested in learning goes there, hmm. right? You have a neighborhood temple, neighborhood health center, neighborhood this thing, neighborhood milk booth. You have a neighborhood co-learning space where all the physical parts that you want for people hmm. to meet each other is there, hmm. and people will learn through a central model which is available. Which even Indian government is trying to do. They've created SOAM, they're going to create other things. So information will be disseminated through an electronic system. Even today, yeah. it happens so often that six of us are meeting and mm -hmm. everyone is looking at their mobile phone and also talking to others. Right. right? So mm -hmm. that will be the model of learning. You will mm -hmm. talk to other humans with respect to whatever you want, but can still be on your mobile or laptop or whatever for your educational purposes and assistance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This to me is likely to become the future because you create a good infrastructure. Now we are talking of 5G everywhere. We are talking of uh, 
even 4G being broadband being available in a number of villages. The other day he said that there are 300,000 community service centers in this country already. They can all become community learning centers. Mm -hmm. uh, so in every so even when you uh, need a bit of social distancing, etc., you can just go to your neighborhood complex and do that. Why should you go further? Yeah. And this whole idea that I need 22 acres for a university looks yeah. so stupid today. You need a good professor right. <laughs> and willing to learn how does 22 acres matter? Right. For that matter, 8 acres for a school, 2 acres. So they, all the regulators appear to be so stupid because everything they set for hmm. is not happening today. Hmm. Right? And they are encouraging that. So they are not saying that close means really close. We will see after. Uh, everything is over. No, as you know, teachers are being hard work to get into online teaching, to continue teaching, we're talking online assessment, we're talking about this. So there is a clear acknowledgement that the old model, hmm. uh, earlier it was failing on pedagogical grounds, now it is failing on operational grounds. You simply can't do that. Yeah. See, the buses cannot carry people in those hmm. numbers, you have to hmm. leave every alternative seat. The classroom cannot do that because you have to leave every alternative thing right. yeah. and so on and so forth. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, so uh, sir, if, if I've understood you correctly, what you're saying is that um, we, we would be having some co-learning spaces which are in the neighborhood and people will go over there and there will be a lot of uh, dissemination of information. Absolutely. And, and you will have a good social crisis. interaction. You see, yeah. one of the problems that traditional school has is you are only with children of your age group for the yes. 12 years you are in school. Correct. Earlier at home, people had people of different ages. You yes. had somebody bigger to you, somebody smaller to you. Right. In fact, uh, you should at least, uh, in US, the very popular concept was one room school house. And the idea was because the population was sparsely populated, I mean, mm -hmm. sparsely dispersed, in a given village, you would have somebody of class six, somebody of class five, somebody of class four, they would all go to the same place. Mm -hmm. US presidents have come out of such a thing. Okay. And you being in education should read a book by Salman Khan called One World Schoolhouse. Okay. Now that one world schoolhouse has emanated from this idea that in the US it used to be one room schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. Where all children of learning age. Now now with lifelong learning, we can even have grown ups over there. Yeah. Yeah. And therefore we are talking of a learner community. We are not talking of segregation by age. But mm -hmm. we are saying all these people have a disposition of learning. The grown-ups can also contribute. The young can also contribute. The grown-ups will bring their experience and knowledge. The young will bring their enthusiasm and creativity and innovation. And that's the way to move on. All right. Great, sir. I think it's a, it's a huge uh, shift and a change uh, which India might witness if it so happens that we have uh, co-learning spaces. And quite and doable. Something. You've been uh, talking quite a lot and we know that now we are in that age where there is artificial intelligence and uh, virtual reality, the augmented reality, big data, machine learning and all of these things. So uh, how do you think, sir, that we need to increase the teacher competence? How should we increase the teacher competence so that they are able to make the best use of this technology and make our children uh, more future ready? Yeah, so actually it is very simple. I think uh, one of the very important things, and I said this uh, sometimes, uh, it dawned upon me one day, so let me begin with the story. So mm -hmm. when I was in school, uh, and in school physics you are taught something called simple machines, which is the inclined plane, the lever, the pulley, yes. and you are talking about lever of first kind, second kind, etc. Yes. yes, sir. My elder brother was going to engineering college and there he was studying theory of machines and machines that make machines. Mm -hmm. I was very impressed with the idea that he is going to learn about machines that make machines. But today I understand like an automobile factory or any factory is a machine which makes machines. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to say today is that teachers must acknowledge their learners first. Mm -hmm. And if they have forgotten that, let us rekindle that. Yeah. And teachers are learners who create other learners. Mm. Therefore, because when you talked about co learning space, the idea was that everybody there is a learner. Right. Somebody knows more, somebody knows less, somebody knows more in a certain area, somebody knows less in another area. So they're all in the journey of learning. So the, the point is that once we agree with that, so therefore everything new that is there, why should a teacher not be excited about mm. uh, experiencing virtual reality? 
Yeah. I've got an Oculus Rift and I've kept it in my Almera because I think that is the way it will be in future and okay. so on and so forth. So mm -hmm. why should they not explore? Why should they say that it is my role only to do this? Yeah. And one of the very important reasons which I tell people to do yeah. this is that except for misfortunes, the longevity has increased. Mm -hmm. And therefore, mm -hmm. retirement will not happen at 60 or 55. Right. Yeah. So I have my senior colleagues mm. who have drawn pension for more years than they drew salary. Okay. <laughs> After PhD abroad, they came and joined IIT Kanpur at the age of 40 mm. as a professor, etc. Yeah. They retired at 60. Right. Where they are 85 and more. Right. So they've drawn pension mm. for more years than they drew salary and they are still wanted. Yes. So my senior colleagues are still teaching people quantum mm. mechanics, etc. So there aren't enough teachers to teach them. Sure. So the point is that learning is a very important thing. It's a lifelong activity and there is no point in planning for a life of 55 years or 60 years or something. I mean, either you are unfortunate, it will be cut short at times that you have no control over. Correct. If you look at traditional aging, hmm. Most of the people will live well beyond yeah. 80s, well beyond 80s into the 90s. Well, look at Ram Jaj Malani still going strong yeah. and so on. And there are many others. I was at a conference recently, academic conference. They were the ones with the person who was 99 years old. Mm -hmm. And he got up and he was arguing like any academic. It was impossible to keep him quiet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. sure. No crutches, no this thing, no microphone needed. His voice was as loud as everything and so on. So it is very important for people to see that if they want a long journey of happiness, mm. it's a perpetual learning which will provide that. Correct, correct. So uh, here also, sir, you're saying that teachers also have to let themselves explore. They have to open themselves to a lot of learning and then uh, take on learning because, they, as you said, longevity has increases, increased. So therefore, um, every teacher has to keep on learning, keep updating and then um, see that. And it's an enjoyable thing because if yes. you're curious, mm. for example, uh, now that the virus come, mm. I think everything about Baltimore classification of viruses, what are the seven kinds of viruses. Therefore, all teachers, as I said, are first learners and anything that they come across, Back to my original thing, ignorance is no excuse. Yes. And therefore, it is important for you to be well informed and aware. Like Mahatma Gandhi said, uh, insights, if you can be violent and choose to be non-violent. Yeah. So you are knowledgeable and still choose to be modest about your knowledge right. is a good thing. Correct. Correct. Right, sir. Um, sir, um, we've talked about uh, schools and university, education, teachers, everything. Uh, so what is your advice to the parents? Uh, that uh, what is that which they should do so that they can prepare their children for this uh, increasingly changing world? Yeah, so first thing is, and uh, I really like somewhere, I don't know where I read, but Kahil Gibran has mm -hmm. a very nice quote where he says, your children are born to you, but they don't belong to you. Mm -hmm. I think this is very important. Most of us start thinking of children as possessions. Earlier, we used to think of women as possessions. Mm -hmm. We used to have harems and so on and so forth, which are inevitable. Now we see children as possessions. Mm -hmm. And we see the children as possessions to be showed off. So we would put them on a, yeah. you know, publish them, this thing, put them on a showcase, and what to showcase at This is what is important to understand that it is a part of the continuum, it is a part of life's evolution. Your grandparents, parents, you and your children and grandchildren and whatever is a story of it. It is not in a sense of ownership. It is very important to appreciate. And the world that your children live in and will live in is very different from the world you lived in or your parents lived in. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you should be ready to accept that and prepare them for that. There's another thing which I think you'd be a little amazed to hear that. Yeah. If you are a young mother, you have to prepare your child for the 22nd century. 21st century is over. A child who is born in 2020s, mm -hmm. if he lives to be 90, he will be in the 22nd century. True, true. Yes, yes. Right. So it's very different from what you might have seen or heard or learned from. You can imagine. Yeah. No, but that is truth. Mm -hmm. We are in 2020. 
Mm. Children born today, you see the 22nd century. Absolutely. Most of them, some mm. of them may not, but mm. most of them, yes. you see the 22nd century. So when people talk to me about 21st century education, I said, why are you pointing to <laughs> Which is where they will spend their last years. Right. right. That is the most important. Mm. The they will go through. But how yes. do you spend the last few years of your life? Right. Education should prepare you for that. Right. So this is thing which is very important, and the other thing that is, in my view, very important is that uh, if you look at the coronavirus story, the essential weapon against coronavirus is your immunity. Mm. Rest is all make believe. Yeah. Right. Those who have a strong immunity are able to resist it. Right. Now this is very important. So the point is, your education should develop immunity against future shocks. Mm. Right. The purpose Wonderful. of education yeah. is to develop immunity against future shocks. Mm. Right. And this is what is important. So go back to my original story about ignorance. Mm. So from ignorance to knowledge, we are talking of a immune system against future changes. Correct. If you don't have that, you will either perish like the dinosaur or the dodo. Yeah. Or even if you look at that, king of the jungle is a protected species now. Mm. He was king of the jungle. Yeah. But he was not king of the urban, the metro, the IT mm. age, the fourth yeah. industrial age. There has become a protected species because some humans have shown compassion. Mm. And therefore, the whole idea is, and one can put it back to the word that we are saying. First, create interest, curiosity, desire to learn, mm. and then learn well. Not to pass exam or school yeah. mark, so that when I know, I know that I know. Correct. That is the thing. I should not say I have a piece of paper to show that I know. Right. I should know that I know and be able to do that. So this is exactly the thing. So like you're saying, don't prepare them for a sprint. Hmm. CBSE, IIT, JEE or NEET or whatever. Prepare them for the marathon. Hmm. Prepare them for the make them long distance runners. Right. And a long distance runner is a very different thing from a short sprint thing. Correct. And the learning for immediate goals mm. should be way to this thing. Uh, one of the challenges that happens, and many people ask me, you're saying all these big things of future ready, etc. But what about tomorrow? Mm. Future will come 80 years later, but the next 10 years, what do I do? And I have tried to say that you can respond to this on the basis of what is known as the Pareto principle. Mm -hmm. The Pareto principle of 80-20 applies in various places is that you apply it to your own pursuit. 80% of your energy, resources, etc. you spend on the conventional part, what is the established part for today. Mm -hmm. But 20% you spend on future readiness, on building your immune system, on keeping yourself future proof and so on and so forth. And this will continue to be throughout. So yeah. this can go for the next 10 years. The next 10 years you know again what is certain and what is future. And so, on. so this can be a universal principle that you could use in life. Absolutely, sir. It's a workable formula wherein 80% for conformity, 20% build up your immune system, create your learning skills, develop Absolutely. curiosity, learn for the sake of learning. And now, for example, in the last two months, they have demonstrated you can do this yes. through electronic means. Right. So no quarrel with school. Hmm. So we do the school part, but I spend only 80% of my effort budget on the school part. 20% mm. of my effort budget on the electronic part, which I do separately from the rest of the world. Correct, correct. So thank you so much. It was a, uh, it's a, uh, it was a lovely advice for uh, the parents. Uh, so coming on to something which is really personal, and I would like to take you back to your school days. Um, I, I know that you received, a, uh, you had written a letter to Sir Richard uh, Feynman when he when he received the Nobel Prize, and. Uh, and you also got a reply back from him with a personal note. Um, so, sir, as a student receiving a reply from a Nobel laureate, so what were your first reactions to that? Yeah, so, so this is what I meant by youth. See, mm -hmm. youth does not care about that. So at that time, I was at a university level, but still mm -hmm. about, uh, that's the year is 1965 or so, so I'm about mm -hmm. 18 years. So mm -hmm. You don't care that, oh, Richard Feynman, Atom Pono, whatever. So I wrote him a letter congratulating him and he sent me back a letter acknowledging etc. And at that time, you know, pen friends used to be a very common yes. Word yes. phrase. So yes. I called him my pen teacher. Hmm. And he had, what is more interesting is that has happened in 65 and gone. Hmm. Uh, sometime back, a nephew of mine 
Hmm. Found this book where he was traveling. This is book I've given you. This is called perfectly reasonable thing for him to meet and track. And in this book, he hmm. saw my letter and reply printed. And then he called me and said, "It must be you. Who else could it be in Allahabad?" And I was very pleased to see that it is over there, and I'm very happy because at some level, hmm. this is also a very good description of me. Perfectly hmm. reasonable deviation from the beaten track. I think hmm. this describes me also very well. That yes. I have done the usual thing. So the point is that uh, it also shows that when you are talking to really great people, hmm. they are perfectly happy to engage with you. So yes. if you remember that cold learning space that I talked about, yeah. a very senior person may be there. So in hmm. my career. Hmm. Early on, I have interacted with Nobel laureates in flesh and blood, Aunt hmm. Smith, yeah. Salam, so many others, and so on. And that changes how you live hmm. and how you work. So yeah. I think instead of compartmentalizing into a specific students and one teacher for them, hmm. two teachers for them, if they meet a lot of people of different hmm. kind of things, including people who are working, people who are entrepreneurs. See, once you have this whole learning space, you will find professionals wanting to come there. Yes. Speak to children. Mm -hmm. Children say, "Okay, this is what a lawyer looks like. This is what a doctor looks like. This is what happens, and so on." Right. So it can be very uh, interesting. So I have uh, no hesitation in saying that I have been very much influenced by the people I have come into contact with, and uh, both in terms of in person and through their books and so on and so forth as well. That's right. very very uh, interesting. Absolutely. Uh, so, sir, uh, you've been very fortunate to be actually meeting so many uh, Nobel laureates, talking to them, different scientists. You've visited so many different countries as well. Um, but for our children who are there right now, and even for the educators, uh, I know that you have got specific 55 words of uh, inspiration or motivation. So, if you could just tell those 55 words so that all of us, you know, feel motivated. So, so actually what happened this occurred to me uh, sometime because mm -hmm. people said that, you know, uh, the children's span of attention nowadays is very little. Mm -hmm. So, and we professors are accused of uh, talking at length. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea is that children's attention is very limited. So I just one day thought to myself that if I had 10 words that I had to say to something, what would I say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I'm nine, what would I say? If I'm eight, what would I say? And these are not my things. These are quotations of well-known people. Yes. Hmm. Now, it happens so, if you know arithmetic progression, uh, 1 yeah. plus 2 plus 3 to 10 is 10 into 11 upon 2, 55. So yeah. I called it 55 words of inspiration. I also created a PowerPoint on it, which I've shared with you. Hmm. But uh, the first thing, if I have 10 words to say, I will say, remember Vivekananda. He said, arise, awake, and stop not till the goal is reached. This is right. Swami Vivekananda. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have nine words to say, there is a famous thing from uh, Rig Veda, Arno Bhadra Kittavo Yantu Vishwata, which in English means, let noble thoughts come to us from all directions. Yes. If I have eight words to inspire, this is from Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was one of the very successful presidents. And some people said, you know, he is lucky. And he is responded by saying, the harder I work, the luckier I get. Okay. So I thought that is a very important one. Mm. Uh, for seven words, uh, this is something from Shakespeare's Hamlet, the very famous speech, Polonius, uh, where the Shakespeare says, neither a borrower nor a lender be. And you know, all the financial crisis <laughs> mm. has largely happened because of this. Yeah. Uh, Gandhi, he said very beautifully in six words, you can imprison my body, but he says, no one can imprison my mind. You remember we were talking about education, yeah. etc. Yeah. And that's why they say education is a liberating force. Mm. Uh, for five words, I have inspiration from Bhagavad Gita. So I'm sorry, from Gautam Buddha. So when Gautam Buddha was on his deathbed, his most favorite people, Anand, asked him, So without you, how will we manage? Mm. And he said, Be a lamp unto yourself. Apo Deepu mm -hmm. Baba, but be a lamp unto yourself. For four words, there's a famous quotation from Einstein, hmm. because while quantum mechanics were probabilistic, Einstein did not like the idea. And because Einstein was a least believer in God, he said, God does not play dice. And that is the four words, God doesn't play dice. For three words, my inspiration is Ravina Tagore. Hmm. And the three words are Akla Chalore. Right. And he says, if nobody hears your thing, then Akla Chalore. And this is very important, especially yeah. when you are in a part of something new, I mean, whether it was uh, Copernicus on his own thing or Darwin or whatever, they had to go on their own path because the rest of the world was not agreeing with them. Mm -hmm. And they were to be Akla Chalore, 
is a very very inspirational three word thing if there are only two words then my phrase is just shine and just shine is the philosophy of the sun the sun doesn't care what happens it just burns itself out typically a fusion of helium but it burns itself out to shine yeah. that's all mm. therefore if there are two words for inspiration that yeah. if there is just one word i have to say mm. what would i say and the answer is excel it is yeah. not self excel it is not microsoft excel mm. it is pursuit of excellence yeah. and uh, i was very pleased with this and therefore i created a powerpoint slide also mm. i said this very often in my talks mm. that these 55 words can actually it can be almost a philosophy in a nutshell absolutely sir so you have covered all the different aspects in this uh, 55 words everything all aspects of life as well Uh, so there are such beautiful collections, uh, and I'm sure all of the everybody who is seeing this program would be benefited by this. Um, so my last question to you is that what keeps you going? See, I think uh, it is the same thing that I said very early. I am still very curious. I need to know, and fortunately for me, I know enough to be interested in learning more. Sometimes, if you know enough, mm. you are not. Uh, wanting to learn more because you don't have the background for it. Correct. Now, because I know some physics, I know some math, I know some biology, I know some philosophy, I know something about religions. Whenever something new comes, I am exactly at that point where I know part of it and I don't know the rest. Correct. And therefore, I am very, very curious. So I will share with you today, for example, nowadays I am comparing the effect of the virus, hmm. the effect of the nuclear bombs. You know the nuclear bomb had entered uranium so many kilos. The bomb itself was thousand kilos and so on. The mm -hmm. entire coronavirus in the world today is less than one gram. Yes. I was telling somebody tomorrow's chief of defense staff will not be a weapons expert, will be a virologist. <laughs> so this is exactly what I said is mm -hmm. what keeps me going and interested. It is intrinsic nature, also the conditions are developed because very true. If I could not understand what are mathematical equations, if I could not understand what is DNA, RNA, etc., I would mm. not follow all this. Right. But because I have that understanding, because mm -hmm. coronavirus has this kind of an RNA, then it has a lipid right. layer or whatever protein, etc. Proteins are made of amino acids. Amino acids have NH2 in them, etc. So I think it is because of that background, mm. and as you saw from science and arts and law and philosophy, mm. it makes life very interesting for me. So yes. the new thing. Is uh, something which I like to know of and so on. Some people's background may not be enough. Then may not be able to. But every day, I am just in a car accident. That's what. If you really don't know the background, so I am fortunate enough to know things at that level where I am curious to understand what I don't really know. Hmm. Right, sir. So uh, it's the knowledge which is actually propelling you to take uh, exactly. more uh, knowledge. Mm -hmm. All right. This sir, is what is a very important aspect. People forget that. That's why when you want to make learners, you have to create in them that much body of knowledge yeah. for them to be able to create more knowledge, absorb more knowledge, etc. Absolutely, sir. It's uh, it's actually absolutely thrilling talking to you. It's so uh, knowledgeable. In fact, the whole conversation, uh, and I think that people have to see it twice or thrice to get the complete value out of this uh, talk. You talked about some of the very revolutionary ideas into education, um, and and I believe that uh, this will get into reality after some time. Um, yeah, I think it will. Yeah. So thank you so much, sir, for uh, giving your time. It was uh, absolutely lovely talking to you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. All the best for all your efforts. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, you heard Professor M. M. Pant talk about what is his vision of education. How is it he uh, that he sees education transforming in next ten years? What are the skill sets which will be needed by the students, by teachers, by parents, and how is the university education going to change? You also heard about the motivating words which he had to say to everybody. I hope you have taken back some good, very important points which you would like to emulate and use it in your own personal profession life. Thank you so much, and keep watching Leadership Talks. Yeah.